Hi, and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people and unresolved cases. Today we are discussing two women that were originally in our mini-series about the disappearance of Lord Lucan, which was the first case we covered on this podcast. Since doing the episodes about his infamous disappearance, I have wanted to focus on the two women that are integral to the narrative, the victim Sandra Rivett and the witness Veronica Duncan or Lady Lucan. Many of the descriptions of the Lord Lucan case focuses solely on the Lord himself and forget that there was a victim in this case. The amount of people affected by the fallout of what happened to him or those left behind when a loved one is killed or go missing, cannot be understated. Thinking back to the case, despite their pivotal role in the story, their importance seems to often get forgotten, and they frequently remain unseen. I intended this to be an update episode of sorts, when planning it, as more information has been released since last November. But also because since looking into these women's lives, I also believe that they have interesting stories that are not solely entwined with Lord Lucan's. Despite the fact that I intend to discuss these women separate to Lord Lucan's story, if you haven't already listened to the initial coverage of the case of Lord Lucan, it might be worth going back to our first three episodes and having a listen, just so it's in context. This episode does include descriptions of the original crime scene, so please use your discretion when listening. There is an overwhelming amount of information surrounding Lord Lucan's disappearance and the subsequent worldwide investigation. When Lucan vanished on the 7th of November 1974, a manhunt began to search for him. But in the hectic press aftermath, one person seemed to be missing from the narrative, the victim herself, Sandra Rivett. Sandra Rivett was employed as the Lucan's nanny and was at 72A Lower Belgrave Street, Belgravia on the evening of the 7th of November. She was there with Lady Lucan and the Lucan's three children. It was reported by the witness, Lady Lucan, that Sandra went into the kitchen to make some tea when Lord Lucan entered the house and hit her over the head with a bandaged pipe. He then went on to hide her body in the kitchen and then attack Lady Lucan. Lady Lucan managed to escape and sound the alarm and Lord Lucan fled, never to be seen again. While she was immediately named as the victim and the description of the crime was widespread, her story and her identity remained very much in the background. Sandra Rivett was born in 1945 and was the third child of Eunice and Albert Hensby. Her family moved to Australia when she was two years old, but they returned back to the UK in 1955. She was described as popular and well-liked. She worked as an apprentice hairdresser and then moved on to being a secretary in Croydon, London. Her life was blighted with some problems, however, and she is known to have checked herself in as a voluntary patient at a mental institution in Surrey for depression not long after her relationship failed. Mental health was not treated in the same way in which it is treated today, and perhaps not with the same importance. This is a topic that is relevant when speaking about the two women involved in this case. Sandra was resilient, however and she continued on with her life, getting engaged to a man called John. In 1965, she gave birth to a baby boy, but due to the pressures of being a young mother, Sandra found it difficult to cope. She considered giving the baby up for adoption, but her parents stepped in to take over the responsibilities of parenting, and the baby was officially adopted in 1965. In 1967, Sandra married Roger Rivett in Croydon. The two were at different jobs for a while, until Roger found work as a truck driver for Esso, and Sandra eventually found work with the Belgravia Agency, where she was recommended for the job as the nanny for the Lucans. Sandra and Roger's relationship had also come to an end shortly after this, 
and Sandra was with someone else at the time she had started to work for the Lucans. Sandra was described by others as being good at her job, and she was warm-hearted and welcoming. These skills made her invaluable to the Lucans at a time of turmoil for them. After her death, she was included in many reports about Lucan's disappearance, but not much was known of her life or that of her family. Since the end of the investigation into Lucan and the official ruling of him as dead, more has become known about Sandra herself, which allows us to learn more about her personality. In 2014, it was reported in the Express newspaper that a man had recently found out that Sandra Rivett was actually his mother. The man had been adopted at birth and had never known who his birth mother was. When his adoptive mother died, the man decided to try and find out who his mother might be. His adopted mother had kept an envelope full of mementos and information that she thought he would find interesting. He decided to open the envelope and inside he found a letter from a social worker discussing the adoption of a Gary Roger Hensby. There was also a two-page cutting from a newspaper discussing the disappearance of Lucan and the murder of a Sandra Rivet, who had apparently had a secret child and had the child adopted under her maiden name Hensby. Through the investigation, the man discovered that he was in fact the son of Sandra Rivet, apparently born as a result of a relationship with a married estate agent. It was established that this was Sandra's second child to be adopted. The first had been adopted by her parents. After discovering his roots, the man has become fascinated with his biological mother's death and wants to discuss how important her story is. He explained that Sandra was a forgotten victim and he wants everyone to know how what happened that night has affected everyone involved in it. Sandra was, by all accounts, an important part of the Lucan household and was well liked. Her death created a division with those that believed that Lucan was capable of the crime and those that did not believe that Lucan could possibly have done it. Sandra is often overlooked in many stories about the Lucan case and her son is now trying to get her story heard, now that he understands who he is and where he had come from. Sandra is the pivotal person in this story and as a result she should always be remembered and never be forgotten. The life of Lady Lucan has been very much entwined with that of her missing husband Lord Lucan over the years. When researching the original episodes about the case, I could find a mountain of information about Lord Lucan, but really struggled to find out what kind of person Lady Lucan was. Her life was mostly a mystery to the public, despite being such a high-profile figure. Being a witness to the tragic murder of Sandra Rivet and the disappearance of her husband means that she has a privileged role in the case, and this fascinated me. The fact that her life was difficult to unravel was also interesting, as it made me wonder what kind of person was Lady Lucan, and how was her life shaped by the events. Her death in September 2017 seemed to almost mark an end to the investigation, and with it her own speculation of what happened to her husband. She had also begun to discuss her life with Lucan recently and there are some things that had previously not been known. Lady Lucan was born in Uckfield, West Sussex, the daughter of Major Charles Morehouse Duncan and his wife Thelma. Veronica and her sister Christina led a relatively privileged life, and they came from a prestigious family. Major Charles Morehouse Duncan was awarded the Military Cross in World War I, which was awarded for acts of exemplary gallantry. The family enjoyed many privileges and Veronica got used to the life that these afforded her. She studied art in Bournemouth and was known to be quite talented. She then ultimately decided on moving to London. She began a career in modelling and at one stage became the owner of a small printing shop in the city. 
It was at this stage in her life that she was introduced to Lord Lucan by her sister Christina's husband, William Shand Kidd. The pair hit it off straight away and they were married in 1963. The marriage started off well, with the two honeymooning on the Orient Express and enjoying lots of luxuries. In an ITV documentary, Lady Lucan, however, described that she did have her reservations from the beginning of the marriage, saying that the wedding was sparsely attended because neither of us was very popular. The two enjoyed the finer things in life. Lady Lucan enjoyed to go shopping, and Lord Lucan enjoyed gambling. Both very expensive hobbies. The troubles began early on with the pair, arguing about these problems. The marriage was also strained, as after the birth of their three children, Lady Lucan suffered from postpartum depression and struggled to cope with the responsibilities that she had. According to Lady Lucan, her husband was less than helpful and supportive about her mental health and did not do anything to make it better. In articles published recently before her death, Lady Lucan described the atmosphere in their marriage and discussed the abuse that she felt at the hands of her husband. She explained that Lucan would beat her violently to beat the mad ideas out of her head. While these accounts describe disgusting acts inflicted on her, we do have to remember that we do only have Lady Lucan's word for it, as Lord Lucan has been unable to put across his side of the story. Her accounts do paint a picture, however, of a struggling and toxic marriage. Their separation in 1973 seemed inevitable, and Lord Lucan continued to cite Lady Lucan's mental health issues as a reason for why he should gain custody of the children. On the fateful evening of the 7th of November 1974, Sandra Rivett would be killed in the kitchen of the Lucan's home, and Lord Lucan would not be seen again. Her husband's disappearance changed her life forever, and while a lot of Lady Lucan's previous history has been discussed in our other episodes, I think it is important to remember when looking at the events that happened afterwards in her life. Lady Lucan immediately stated that she believed that her husband had committed suicide shortly after he fled. The Lucan family, now headed by Lady Lucan, tried to continue on as normal despite the huge manhunt that was going on around them. The family had been left with a lot of debts, and Lady Lucan was now living as a single mother with no means to support her family. As Lord Lucan would also not be officially declared dead until 1999, Lady Lucan had no means to claim back any money to clear these debts. In 1982, the Lucan children were sent to live with Veronica's sister Christina, and her husband William, as Veronica was struggling to cope. William Shand Kidd was an interesting figure in the narrative. He was known to be a businessman, racehorse breeder and sportsman, who had been friends with Lucan for many years. He is also interestingly connected to another story that has fascinated and appalled many people, that of Princess Diana. He was married to Diana's mother Frances after she left her first husband, the Earl of Spencer. By all accounts, Christina and William helped to give the Lucan children a stable home, and George Bingham, Lord and Lady Lucan's son, described William as the perfect role model. For Lady Lucan, however, so began quite a reclusive life in which she did not have much to do with her children or her family. She continued to live in the same Belgravia home in which Sandra Rivett had been murdered. She described before her death that she had not been invited to her children's weddings, even walking past the church on the day one of her children was getting married, and being told what was happening by someone in the press. She lived mostly estranged from her children from around the 1980s. She continued to have friends, however, and it was one of these friends that noticed that she had not turned up for her usual walk on the 26th of September 2017, and they became concerned for her. The police smashed the window of her home to gain entry to the property, 
and discovered Lady Lucan on the dining room floor with a pill bottle underneath her body. An inquest was held into Lady Lucan's death, and it was discovered that she died from respiratory failure from an overdose of barbiturates and alcohol. It was deemed that her death was a suicide. It was discovered that she had been struggling with health problems before her death, and she had self-diagnosed herself with Parkinson's disease, as she had a slight tremor, she was becoming forgetful, was suffering from insomnia, and had lost her sense of smell. This diagnosis proved not to be correct. In the inquest into Lady Lucan's death, coroner Dr Fiona Wilcox ruled a verdict of suicide. At the hearing, Lady Lucan's state of mind before her death was discussed, and they were told that she had attended a meeting on assisted suicide the year previous. At this meeting she had apparently discussed her own financial issues that she had been having. The hearing was also told about entries in her diary that discussed her plans for taking her own life if she were to become ill and the fact that she had books in her home on assisted suicide. It appeared that Lady Lucan had been planning her suicide for a while. Why Lady Lucan had decided to take her own life is not completely known. However, there is the suggestion that she had already started to believe that she had Parkinson's disease and had possibly been suffering from financial problems that led to further distress. Her friends, however, stated that she did not seem to be seriously considering suicide and she had appeared to be quite happy the last time that they had seen her. The inquest discussed that there was a drug in her system that was not normally prescribed by British doctors and it was unsure how she had obtained it. The coroner did state, however, that there was no evidence of foul play in her death, and there was no evidence of her suffering from mental illness. The death of Lady Lucan, however, was not the thing that grabbed the headlines about her case. The thing that appeared to capture the attention of the public was what was decided in her will. Many newspapers reported on the fact that Lady Lucan decided not to leave any of her fortune to her children. It was not a secret that she had been estranged from her children, so to some it may not have been a surprise. Lady Lucan had decided to leave her money to Shelter, the housing charity. Shelter helps homeless and disadvantaged people to find suitable housing, and the charity itself was very happy to receive the fortune. Her other possessions were to be sold at auction. In a probate document discussed in the newspaper The Telegraph, Lady Lucan had said that in the view of the lack of good manners and reverence shown to me as their parents, I do not wish any of my three children to benefit from my death any more than they have to. Her children, on the other hand, have been very complimentary of their mother and have described that they remembered her lovingly and with admiration. They have also stated that they applaud her decision to give everything to charity. Lady Lucan's story is quite a sad one, but it also shows a woman who was resilient in the face of adversity and faced up to issues that she knew she had. Her role as the sole witness to a horrific crime that involved her infamous husband has continually overshadowed her life, and it is important to remember her as her own person. The lives of Sandra Rivett and Lady Lucan have been connected by the tragedy of what happened on the 7th of November 1974. Even though Lord Lucan is still the feature of many articles when you search for both of these women, their stories deserve to be told. This episode hopefully updates their stories and gives everyone a bit more information about them. Unfortunately, as has been the case for many years, there are still no new updates about Lord Lucan's disappearance, and his case still remains unsolved. Thank you for listening to today's episode. As always, please engage with us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Also feel free to connect with us on our website and send us your thoughts at our email address theunseenpod at gmail.com We would like to do an episode based on listener theories 
which discusses any thoughts and theories that you have on our cases so far. So please send them in to us. Thank you to our five-star reviewers this week, Jess Carter from the Outlines podcast. This is a fantastic UK true crime podcast which I have been listening to recently and love. If you like well-researched episodes and interesting stories, Outlines is definitely for you. And we are really pleased she is also enjoying our episodes. Thank you also to Daniel K. Morgan and Helix2301 for your lovely reviews. Thank you also to our first Canadian review, Whining About Crime. This is also another great podcast that I have been enjoying recently, so if you are looking for something new, definitely check them out. There will be no new episode next week, as I am going on holiday, but there will be one the week after as normal, and this will be the first episode in a mini-series covering quite an infamous unsolved crime in UK history. So please tune in then. Thank you for listening to today's episode and thank you so much for supporting us. As always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. At ID Mobile, we don't waste our money on celebrity voiceovers. That's a real bad shame, because I'm the greatest voice person ever, period. Instead, we put our money into giving customers great service and even better offers. Like getting three months half price on selected 12 months SIM only plans. I love it. That's a really great deal. That's why ID Mobile is a which recommended mobile provider. Switch today at idmobile.co.uk. T's and C's apply.